thing. Hello, hello. Mic check. Mic check. Mic check. I think we're good. Yeah, I think we're fine. All right. All right. Uh, awesome. Uh, well, hopefully everybody's got a seat. Uh, welcome to our talk on creating iconic characters for uh, Overwatch 2. Um, uh, we are going to kind of walk you guys through uh, the whole process from doing concepts through to uh, the final models. Uh, and We've got uh, some awesome people from the Overwatch team here with me. Uh, I am Bert, uh, and I'm the uh, character lead uh, of the outsourcing side of uh, characters. Kind of partnered up with, uh, with our character lead and um, help kind of shape the modeling and stuff that comes through. Um, I've been with Over or well, I've been with Blizzard for about almost 15 years now. Uh, I was with Diablo for a lot of years. I was the uh, character lead on Diablo 3, Reaper of Souls. And then I joined about six years ago, the Overwatch team, and I got to make lots of cool skins. If you guys have played with uh, Butcher Roadhog, or Victory Mercy, uh, Blackwatch Genji was my first skin. Uh, and most recently I did Soldier for Overwatch 2. Uh, and I'll let uh, Rakan introduce himself. Uh, my name is Rakan Kamash. I'm a senior character artist. Uh, I joined Blizzard uh, Three years and a half ago, I joined the cinematics team first, and then I joined today in yeah. cinematics. And a year and a half, I joined the Overwatch team. And uh, yeah, good. Cool. Uh, my name is Q Fang. I'm the uh, character concept lead uh, for Overwatch and Overwatch 2. Um, and I've uh, been here six years, a little over six years. And I got to work on a little bit of everything um, skins, ecologies, uh, heroes. I got to work on Sigma, that was my first hero, and then all the heroes since. Um, yeah. Hi, um, my name is Daryl. Um, I am a senior concept artist here on the Overwatch team. And yeah, like you, um, I've uh, touched a whole bunch of stuff from um, ecology's work to heroes to skins. And yeah, I've been here for about almost uh, four years now. And yeah, it's been nice to have you guys here today. And I guess before we start things off, you know, we have a little bit of a, a nice video that Rakan here has prepared for us. So yeah, let's roll it.
Um, so we're going to start from the concept side, we're kind of the, the spearhead of the production pipeline here. And uh, yeah. Okay, I'm going to turn this so you guys can see this up here a little bit. I'll plug. I don't want to touch any wires. Um, yeah. So I want to start off talking about our kind of character design philosophy. Some core kind of ideas when we think about what it means to make an Overwatch character. Right? Um, first and foremost, right, that's been core to Overwatch since the beginning is uh, creating an aspirational and hopeful future. That goes for our heroes, it goes for our world building. Right? Um, second is a marriage of Eastern and Western appeal. Right? And lastly, we're talking about recognizable and relatable archetypes. And we'll go into each of these. So a little bit about appeal, right? The overall art style of Overwatch could be described as um, East meets West, um, combining the appeals of both uh, Japanese manga and Western comic book art styles. So characters like Diva, Kiriko, and Genji have like a, a stronger Eastern influence, while characters like Junkrat, Roadhog, and Cassidy lean more towards the Western side of things. Um, but you know they all come together and they all have their own balances, you know, to create that beautiful blend of um, aesthetic appeal of both East and West. Um, when it comes to archetypes, right? Each of our characters always begins with a recognizable, recognizable archetype. Uh, then we add a twist to them, right? So easy examples are, you know, Lucio. He's, um, you know, a DJ very recognizably. And, uh, you know, and he's kind of a, a twist on the idea of like a bard, right, in like a more of a fantasy setting. Same thing with Mercy. Very obviously, she's taken inspiration from an angel. She's not literally an angel, but visually, archetypically, right, she's an angel. Um, angel plus doctor, right? Um, and then Winston plays more off the pop culture kind of, uh, the, the visual of a, of a sentient ape that kind of exists out there in pop culture. So we always, want to start with something recognizable and then add our own twist to it, whether that be you know, another theme or, you know, and or kind of a, the, the just general world building and shape design of Overwatch. Cool, so what are the visual pillars we lean on when um, designing characters for Overwatch, right? Um, combat readiness. So Overwatch is like an FPS, you know, where heroes battle each other in fast-paced combat. So um, we always want them, you know, no matter um, what their archetype or their role, you know, whether they're like a friendly medic or you know, a, a scientist, right? Their appearance should always show that they're consciously prepared for battle. So elements on their body, uh, on their kit, you know, we always want to show that, the combat readiness. Uh, next, uh, vibrant colors, right? Even though um, there are some pretty strong and serious themes uh, in the world of Overwatch, we want the overall tone to be brighter and you know, more uplifting in a sense. So does our heroes you know, represent that tone and have vibrant and distinct color palettes? It also helps you know, uh, in a really fast-paced um, battle scene that helps the heroes stand out from each other in battle. And finally, you know, we want all our characters to have very bold forms and very expressive faces. Um, yeah, so first thing is form design. I mean, think Overwatch, one of our, our most important kind of pillars of our, our shape language is the bold form design, right, the chunky shapes. Um, how do we achieve this, right? Um, there's no kind of lack of hard surface to tackle at Overwatch. Everything is, you know, everything is meant to, to kind of be this near future kind of tech. Um, a couple of points we consider when we're doing hard surface design, interlocking shapes, detail distribution, internal and external silhouettes, and lastly, believability, which we'll go into. All right, so I'm gonna go through some of these points with you guys. Um, so silhouette, right? We like to create bold and readable silhouettes at every level. I think um, visually, silhouettes are the most important thing we consider when we're designing characters for um, for uniqueness, for them to read well. So strong silhouette breaks and decisive plays on negative spaces make characters distinctly themselves and brings a lot of visual appeal. So for example, like on Bastion we see over here, um, not only are there nice silhouette breaks and, and statements on the outer side of his silhouette, but within the negative shapes um, inside, like uh, where his 
um, elbow meets his body, right? There are a lot of decisive decisions made there in the lines to make sure the silhouette is readable and it's uh, attractive, right? So we try our best to exaggerate all these negative spaces to make statements. Um, next, interlocking shapes, right? Um, interlocking shapes help create a visual flow between all the pieces on, on the hard surfaces. So it creates a lot of opportunities for aesthetic shape design. And um, having lots of these interlocking shapes makes the overall design feel very intentional, right? Very manufactured and very believable, which we'll get into. Cool. Uh, next, talking about detail distribution, right? Um, this is the, uh, the Genji Mythic skin from, uh, from season one. And uh, it's a great example of a skin that exercises both um, detail distribution on a macro scale, right, a large shape scale, but also on a medium and small <coughs> scale. And what that means is, um, if you look at some of those smaller pieces or the medium sized pieces on his leg, you know, the armor pieces, we have detail, right, that pouch. It's not placed in the middle of the form, it's placed near the bottom two thirds. And that way that we cut the form up into more, um, le less kind of 50-50 shapes, right? We want to create, you know, an area of rest and an area of detail. And that goes for those little washers on his pants, things like that, right? Placing detail near edges, right, as a transition, visually. Uh, and that's on the medium and small shapes. However, at the same time, in the overall large shape, right, you can see his tattoos on his upper half body. They get pretty busy across multiple parts of his body, right? The pieces there are completely busy, right? But that works because the overall character still has an area of rest on them. So, on both that large scale, but also when you get into the weeds of the smaller bits of the characters, we want to create good and detailed distribution to lead your eye around and create areas of, kind of rest and detail. All right, now let's talk a little bit about belie believability. Right. So a quick note on that. Um, we all see and absorb a, a lot of information visually throughout our lives, and subconsciously, right, our, um, our brains are able to inherently able to recognize things that we've seen before. And um, it can relate to the, uh, the visual of what we're seeing to the information we store in our heads. So even if we're designing an abstract sci-fi weapon, right, we, can rec we can rely on recognizable shapes and uh, visual affordances to help the viewer understand better like, uh, and relate to what they are looking at. Um, so for example, over here with uh, this weapon over here, um, mill details right above the barrel, you know, besides aesthetic appeal, they also serve to function like heat vents, you know, if we think about the believability and lore and stuff like that around the barrel because um, wet barrels of weapons get really hot, right? And so that detail looks and feels right being there. So we put little thoughts into things like that when we're designing things like uh, weapons, right? Um, rough textures on the grips make the grip, when you just look at it, one glance at it, it looks like it should be gripped and, you know, it feels like a grip, right? Um, Shapes that have line flow in and out of each other give the feeling of being manufactured. So all these manufactured shapes look good. And little, little details like screw holes, interlocking shapes like we talked about before, right? These things help the viewer subconsciously relate to how everything is put together and ultimately relate to what they're looking at more. Soft colors, right? Overwatch is, you know, part of our kind of look is being vibrant and colorful. And uh, how do we kind of go about this, right? There's only so much, so many colors on the spectrum. You're bound to run out of colors, right? Um, we're, we're, well, we're getting on 30 plus heroes now, and you know, at some point we're gonna run out of colors on the spectrum. Um, but how do we continue to you know, strive for iconic palettes on the character? Um, and the trick here really is making sure every design has a color pop, but also we're not just relying on one character uh, for the identity, color identity of each character, right? Uh, we want to, we usually lean on the combination of the two main colors, so your dominant color and your kind of subdominant or secondary color, uh, to kind of give you the idea and the feel of each character. So, great example here, you got 76, you got Lucio. 76 is, you know, overall it feels like a bluer character, right? He's got that blue on the jacket, um, but so does Lucio, right? Lucio's got a, not the exact same, but a similar blue. Uh, we add a little bit of Q shift, tint, um, value shift, but you know there's plenty of blue on the character, right? <coughs> However, for 76, it's not about just the blue, right? It's about the combination of the blue and the red together that gives you the feeling of 76. Um, of course, in this proportion and in on this kind of you know, body type, right? With Lucio, it's 
more about this slightly tinted kind of lavenderish, purple-ish blue with the green, with a lime green. That gives you the feeling of Lucio. Um, and you see this across the board on our roster as well. Um, you know, we have characters that have overlapping colors and yet their proportion, and by playing with the proportion and the combination of the primary and secondary color, we can create um, very, you know, we can elicit different emotions per character, and that's kind of helps make each character more recognizable. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the differences um, when we w approach skin design versus hero design. With skins, and, um, because we want the theme of the skin to be recognizable right off the bat, we take a very literal approach on all the elements on the skin. And we add our own shape design treatment to, to those literal elements. Oops. For heroes, the visual elements on their body, like their outfit and equipment, right? All these are driven far more by the narrative and the logic behind that narrative. So even if the individual pieces on their outfit all feel and look more abstract, the overall theme comes together to achieve that recognizability. So it's not as literal as how we approach skins. So skin design, right? Um, here we have Kendoka Genji. Um, very much, uh, very literal, very obvious to achieve that recognizability, right? Um, almost all the um, elements on him, uh, the theme of a kendo sportsman is translated literally here onto his body. From the kendo mask, all the way to the sideways protruding shoulder pads of his, and all the way to the bamboo sword, all these are all super literal translations of um, what a kendo swordsman should be. And then the shoes, though, a bit of a sporty a spin on things to make it feel more Overwatch and feel more casual for our Summer Games event. But if we look at every individual element, it is very literal in how we translated the theme. Yeah, and you know, a little bit more on that. I don't know, uh, a little bit more on that, you know, like you see he's got the big bamboo sword, right? Um, you know, we, for an Overwatch hero, we probably, you know, from the near future kind of sci-fi, we probably don't want a character holding a bamboo sword, very traditional bamboo sword in the battle, the way it is, right? Um, but on a skin, at the co risk of this feeling um, whimsical or goofy or you know out of logic, you know, um, it's okay because we want you to understand this as, hey, this, you know who Genji is, and then you see him in a very different way on, with a cool costume. So uh, once again, right? Um, so next, talking about hero design, right? Um, for heroes, um, for heroes, it's it's a little bit different, right? Heroes, we want to. Um, not only make them recognizable, but it, it should be done so in a way that makes sense for the narrative, right? For the world building. So we don't want to go as uh, obvious as straightforward. It, it should be more things that elicit an idea, right? Um, outside of the, the general archetype, the way we achieve um, specific pieces, right? We um, you know, you want to be a little more subtle with it, right? So in case of one your tracer. Um, you know, Tracer is a pilot, right? And even in the 1.0 kind of design, we have, uh, she's wearing a, a pilot's kind of bomber jacket, right? Um, with the British flag on. Uh, but even this, I, I think it makes sense logically in the world for this character to be wearing a jacket, right? It's not so far out of, out of uh, context. Uh, in the 2.0, we opted more for abstract shapes, which we'll talk about later, the differences. Uh, but, you know, another, uh, you know, the pieces that are, are more abstract on her are her kind of her sort of her harness, her chest harness, the gauntlets. Um, those pieces are, because she's an astronaut, or she's a, she's a pilot, she's a test pilot, right? Um, we, we, in, we were inspired by kind of, you know, aeronautic kind of materials and things like that, and, uh, you know, kind of space materials on space shuttles and things like that. But you see that unlike that Genji skin, we didn't literally make those gauntlets into the shape of a spacecraft, or we didn't take parts from a spacecraft and add them directly on we elicit the idea of that material just through the kind of the weathering, the color, right? Um, but the shape design itself feels like it fits the character from a more logical standpoint. So, um, yeah, it, it's taken to a more kind of abstract level. We want to create more new, unique shape design while still feeling like Overwatch, but not so direct. Um, yeah, so. Like I said, right, Overwatch versus Overwatch 2, uh, updating the order. This is more really, um, this is really kind of a visual to how our own internal art style, how, 
how our understanding of the, what Overwatch means, right, our concept art-wise, um, has shifted over the past kind of six years of launch. I joined Overwatch right after it launched, um, it was like summer of 2016, and um, and when I joined, we had a very, you know, we, we had a, it's been six years, right? We have a very different team now, and it's been very interesting to see how, you know, the, you know, each, with each new person, we come in and we kind of take the art style and we and we invent upon it, right, and be more become more familiar with it, right? We have a very we have a much more um, defined understanding when, we come, when it comes to concept art um, than, I'd say, back in 2016, you know? And I'd say that some of the specific um, differences here is um, things got a little, slightly less, you know, slightly less chunky the way we draw them, um, a little more edgy, a little more defined. Um, that's also because working with, you know, the modelers here, um, we kind of have a better idea of how, how we can help them the most, you know, so we are more, precise with where we put lines and how we draw shapes because we are more familiar with what, what, what helps them the most, right? Um, and this is all an effort to kind of, uh, not to change these characters, but to evolve them, right? They should still feel like they belong together in game, um, you know, when they're, when they're modeled out and they're running around in game. Um, but yeah, more attention to detail, a little more intentional. So let's talk about actual designing of a hero. All right. Um, you know, Overwatch is a team. A lot of what we do is based around the context of creating a hero. Once you make a hero, you kind of understand, okay, I kind of understand how this pipeline works, how that pipeline works, right? Um, this is what the team is built on. Um, so how do we start on a hero? Right. So the idea of a hero can begin with any of the three kind of um, Called the prototype disciplines. It's, you know, we started with those kind of three places: gameplay, narrative, and art. Gameplay being you know, how they play in game, the mechanics. Right, those are designers that work on those. Narrative. We have narrative designers, and writers who kind of create the story and you know mold them into the universe of Overwatch. And then art, which is what we do. Right, um, and generally starts with concepts. Uh, can begin with any of these three departments. Right, and some examples. Uh, and a hero that. For example, that began with the gameplay is uh, Orissa. We needed an anchor tank in the game. That's what she was called at the time. And uh, you know, we needed a tank in the game that kind of held down the line, just like Reinhardt would. Right. And uh, that was a general design brief from the, the design team. And we took that and explored on visuals that would help um, really show that. That makes you understand that uh, as you play the character, that fulfills that fantasy. And then afterward, afterwards, kind of narrative came on and molded her into that story, right? Example of a character that starts from narrative would be Ash. Um, she was a really cool character that existed in the, the Cassidy cinematic um, that we did. Um, and uh, she was not a hero, she wasn't planning to be a hero, but then we had, you know, while we were jamming up new heroes, the, uh, some of the, you know, the designers just happened to separately make kits for her where Bob was the, uh, the ultimate. And so it just felt right. And so this character was then added into the cast as a hero, even though she started just as a character in the general universe. Right? Another example of this is uh, Brigitte. Um, and lastly, um, a bulk of our heroes, especially the original ones, came from an, uh, kind of an art kind of inspiration uh, from our art director, Arnold Tseng, who made, uh, you know, who's kind of set the style for us and made a lot of the old, um, you know, the, the, the previous heroes. Um, a lot of those heroes came from, you know, early sketches that they had and they just kept, you know, just made them into heroes and, Gameplay and narrative just was able to come together and make a kit and also a story that just fit the look of the hero. Um, and that's always, you know, really fun for us, obviously. Yeah. Um, so, we can get into the weeds of, like, kind of the process of doing a hero, right? Um, our general process goes from ideation. So, for Echo, this is uh, by, by Arnold. Um, you know, we, we kind of do ideation, variation, iteration on the look of the overall hero or the specific parts. Um, yeah, and then we, before kind of we enter the full kind of pre-production phase, we generally do a prototype phase where we overall figure out the look of the hero, right? That's, that's, on, that's on concept to do. And uh, we jam with, you know, with, uh, with Bird, the Bird and the Cons guys and we start to kind of figure out what works, what doesn't, and then start doing a preliminary block out, right? And just to, just to get everybody on board, we have a concept. And this concept is prone to change down the line as we figure out what works, what doesn't, 
as the narrative changes, you know, as the gameplay might evolve, we will uh, evolve the art because we want the, the overall goal of, of kind of the core philosophy of how we do heroes is we want um, we want gameplay, visuals, and story to fit together as seamlessly as we can, right? So with each changing of decision on each of those disciplines, it should and will affect the other disciplines as well. Um, so, um, you know, uh, after this, right, as we go into production, as these guys kind of, you know, we hand off the concept and as we really get into the pace of making this hero, uh, you know, the concept will be around to support uh, all the different production departments like uh, animation, VFX, um, with concepts that um, help visualize these things. Right? Like we, we provide VFX studies for, for things like abilities. Right? This is a uh, study I did for uh, Echoes, um, just how, what she looks like when she transforms. Right? There was a technical limitation here. Of, you know, we can't, like, um, we have to like hide the, the changing of the hero so when it loads in, right? So how do we solve that? How do we solve it in a way that's still appealing visually? So maybe there's a bright glow which is surrounded by the liquid light things like that, right? Just an idea. Uh, the guys who make it will take this and, you know, make it look good, make it actually work, but, you know, we provide kind of a, a general kind of direction. Um, and then the other thing that we provide as well is uh, action, action studies. This is more for the animators, but also just for everybody to just be able to get a sense of who this character is, you know? Uh, recently, we actually started doing more expression studies as well, just to get an idea of the personality, working more closely than we ever had before with um, uh, the narrative designers as well, um, to really nail down um, who this hero is. Right. Um, yeah. All right. So now I'm going to talk you guys through a little bit about our skin creation process. It's a lot more straightforward uh, compared to hero creation, right? So. Um, how we start um, dealing with skins is we start with the direction. Right? For the overall direction of skins for Overwatch 1, they came from our seasonal events like you know, um, Summer Games, our Halloween Terror, things like that. And for Overwatch 2, moving forward, we're going to base our direction off all our Battle Pass themes. Um, so next, from the direction, we take that idea right, and we start pitching our, um, some skin ideas to, um, to the team. And we come up with things like that, and a lineup of ideation sketches right here. So we're taking the, the theme of it, we run with it with the team, um, uh, bang out a few of these, then we talk about it, right? And we, we want to capture the theme and the overall tone of the skin. That's the um, objective with the ideation sketches. We don't want to get into the weeds to solve all the problems here at this stage. All right, then from there, right, we flesh out the design uh, with line drawing, right, um, of the front view, and we work out all the details and we solve most of the problems. That's when, um, this comes right after, oh, yeah, all the, the skins in, in ideation have been approved. Um, we got to be like, yeah, that looks cool, but let's run with that, and we take that all the way to uh, final design. And yeah, with the line drawing over here, we try to solve most of our problems, right? Um, so then, from then, we take everything to a flat color stage. And uh, when I say flat color, you know, it, I feel like this stage is more involved than, um, than people make it out to be sometimes. But yeah, um, once we figure everything out, the color separations, the material breakouts, um, once we figure all that out, the skin is basically done. And it could actually, we could move on to doing um, rendering if time allows. But you know, once you have the flat color, you attach a separate sheet of material callouts to it, you can basically tell uh, the modelers can run with it. Um, Rakan and Bird, you know, super talented guys, just look at that and like, yeah, we, we know what's going on. We can take it all the way to the finish. So that's what usually happens. And finally, we, to wrap things up, you know, there are certain things within, the skin, within skins that need call-outs, like, you know, things that transform. Bastion over here um, has stuff that opens up and stuff like that. So wherever necessary, right, we need to inform the artist down the pipeline, oh, this piece should be like that. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah. Um, we, things need to be a certain way um, it, when, when it moves and it transforms. So this is the kind of uh, call-outs we do um, to show all the artists working on it. Oh, we need to model like that, we need to animate like that, right? And yeah, especially for troublesome characters like Bastion over here. Um, all right, and that, that's the end of our concept art section. Next up, Bird and Rakan will run you through the modeling part of our pipeline. All right.
Yeah, let's All do right. it. <clears throat> All right, so you guys might be wondering what's different in Overwatch 2, right? And like, what's new? So we got a bunch of new boats and sort of like, you know, detailed maps, uh, air shader, eye shader, uh, more, more polling and more budgets to work with and light improvements. You guys excited to hear all about these stuff? Yeah. yeah. Awesome. We're not going to talk about any of these because <laughs> <laughs> we actually want to give you something that at the end of the day you can take with you and apply to your own art instead of making this like a tech car. There we go. Okay. So yeah, so... <laughs> Sorry for the, uh, the little uh, left turn on you. But the fact is, is you know, again, we've got lots of bells and whistles, and we don't want this to be a tech talk. We want you guys to be able to go, hey, I'm going to go home, I'm going to get inspired, I'm going to go make some cool art. You know, so what are some things that are actually applicable to the stuff you guys are doing? So uh, on the big, broad side of things, we have kind of these modeling pillars. And, and I'll say this, you know, it, there's so much tribal knowledge that happens within a game team that you know, sitting down just to write things, these things down, I'm like, you know, I don't know that we've ever put them in this way, so you guys are kind of seeing it for the first time, but this is, these are the things that are sitting top of mind for us. Um, like the concept crew was just talking about, uh, we have this idea of these bold, exciting shapes and colors. It's core to Overwatch. It's this bright, uh, inviting universe. So it's always important to get that stuff to be big and bold and poppy. Um, and then we have this idea of amplifying intent. And I thought about this, uh, the best way to put this out there, but the, because it, it needs a little bit of explanation. Uh, the thought behind this is that uh, within the world of Overwatch, we've got characters that are all about different things. You've got tanks, you've got your, your damage uh, characters. You've got uh, characters like, like, like the Junkers, like uh, Junkrat, for example, his whole kit is going to be slapdash together. He's got stuff bolted to things. You know, it's all over the place. Well, the design sensibilities that go into Junkrat are going to be very different than what goes into a character like Sojourn. And you know, Sojourn is a very stoic hero. She's a leader. You know, she's very controlled and calculated. And so we're doubling down on that design for that the, whatever character that we're working with. And so I, you know, picked this example of the Kiriko from the Cyber uh, skins. Because everything about it, you know, should say cyber, you know, and so, you know, we're going to show some examples of some of the cyber stuff that's coming out. Um, and then the last thing is, is this concept of just, they have to be game-ready cinematic characters. Like, we're trying to bridge the gap between gameplay, where you're running around, like, this is, I mean, it's an eSport, it's a, it's a, a competitive uh, game. You've got to be able to read these characters from a distance. But on the flip side, we're telling stories with it, and you guys will see stuff in the upcoming months where we get more into the story side of things, and it's gonna be super exciting. But these characters have to be able to emote and have expressions and be able to interact with each other. So we're gonna walk you guys through uh, the process of how we create these characters. And again, these, there's a lot of design sensibilities that hopefully if you're here and you're like, oh, I don't do 3D, I, I'm a concept person, you guys hopefully can pick up some things out of this you know, that will help you guys create you know, better, you know, better models. Um, and, and there's a lot to say about all this stuff. So we've kind of cherry picked a handful of things that we think are really important in each of the stages. Um, so we're going to start here uh, with the block out. And the block out, I will say, like, we like to think about this as where the art direction happens. This is almost the most important stage of the whole thing because if it doesn't work here, you know, it's, it's probably not going to work down the road. So uh, real quick, we're going to talk a little bit about edge flow, shape design, uh, dynamic silhou silhouettes, and then uh, supporting the animation. Uh, so we, we think about this idea of talking shapes, right? The idea that shapes are going to talk to each other. And so we're looking at things like busy versus simple. And that might be a curve versus a straight. It might be complex versus uh, far less complex. You can see how this plays out in a character like this Cyber Roadhog, where you know, he's got, you know, there's a lot of busyness, and yet you, there's areas to rest. Uh, and so we try to play those things off of each other. Um, we lean heavily into this idea of S-curves and C-curves. You can see the little red line down there. If we find ourselves going back on an S-curve, uh, it's probably getting a little noodly and noisy. And again, you can kind of see, in, just in this block out, you can see how we're capturing 
these S curves, these C curves. We're looking for resonant lines, you know, kind of like a chorus in music, like where things kind of play off each other. And then the idea of crashing angles. So we try to avoid parallels as much as possible because there's no movement in a parallel. So again, you know, all with, contained within this character, you can see all these different elements that are kind of coming together to create, you know, hopefully a very appealing design. So we're kind of crashing all these shapes in together. Um, you know, the guys had talked a little bit about this, these bold silhouettes. And hopefully you guys can look at here and you know who these characters are with no details in here at all. Um, and so we have kind of an immediate read, and this is the thing that you might see from, from a distance, you know, if, they're, if the lighting is knocking out all that detail, you know. Uh, then we have this idea of secondary shapes, and so we're playing up values and color changes. Um, so we're picking up these, these elements and we're kind of grouping them together, hopefully in, in interesting ways. And then with these little accents, and these are those little details that push it over the top and just make you go, okay, that's, that's super cool. Um, and so these are the actual, um, the actual blockouts that we used for Ash and Reinhardt when we were first doing the new skins for the Overwatch 2. Uh, and finally, uh, with the blockout stage, uh, supporting animation. The thing is, we can make a beautiful model and it'll look fantastic on ArtStation or where, wherever, but the fact is that it means nothing if our animation team can't go in there and make it do all the things it needs to do. So, um, you know, that means, uh, like on the left here, you can kind of see, it means good facial topology. It means arms that can bend and get over a character's head and, and still look good. Um, and then I have this example, if you look on the bottom here, when we were trying to figure out Torbjorn, the original concept had this huge plate-like uh, apron. And we tried it, and you can see the animation here, it clips all over the place, like in between the legs, it just doesn't feel right, it doesn't hinge. So we had to kind of retool it uh, in the, con in the uh, blockout, and so you can see, here's the, the blockout retooled, so it's got a hinge, it's a little tighter, um, and it just plays better, despite the fact that in a single image, it may not have been as cool. And you can see, like, in the final model, you know, hopefully, like, everything's working together super nice. And, and so I'm going to pass this on to Rakan for a second here, and he will talk a little bit about the high-poly process. All right, so... Now we got the black out approved. I got my dude over here, Hammond. He's gonna help me with the high poly. Uh, so high poly, we we talk, gonna talk about uh, floaters, plus the concept and, and the fabric basics. All right, floaters. Uh, what are, what are floaters? Floaters are basically like. Oh, sorry. So if you have a mesh, you have another mesh that's floating on top of it. Simple as that. That's why we call floaters. Why would you want to use floaters? Because they're easy to model, super quick to edit. And at the end of the day, nobody cares about how your mesh looks like. It's all going to get baked down to the game asset, and that's what the players are going to see. Uh, if you look at the backpack here, uh, uh, we actually learned to model that. It's awesome. Here you can see the base mesh. This is like the clean base mesh with no details. And right here you can see with all the details. That, that's basically the floors. So you can see it can go back and after. So most of the high frequency details are basically floors. And another picture that pretty much shows uh, the whole thing together. Yeah. All right, plus in the concept. Uh, when we get the concept from uh, the concept team, we almost never just take it, model it here the way it looks. We always like to uh, plus it. Um, a couple of examples here, if you look at the pants of uh, Sojourn, uh, if you look at the belt, we have uh, the belt, and there's like a small details here, there, the buckle area, all these got plus after we got the concept. We got those details for, you know, the buff to make it look more functional, the knee area because we know it's got a bend, so we emphasize that with the, you know, with the folds, and the buckle just to make it look cooler, basically. Uh, on the right side, we can see Torb's uh, glove. I can just go to the back here. You can see how the concept was and how much more detail we add to it. And to us, um, gloves or any areas that's in the first person, super important because that's what the player is going to see most of the time. So we just add extra attention to these and add more detail. Okay, so um, just a couple of high notes on fabrics. And uh, uh, Mr. Renault, who's in the audience here, actually uh, modeled this for uh, Jumper Queen. Uh, 
And uh, the way we approach fabrics in general, we try to keep everything nice and clean. You can see there's trim in that initial uh, model there. Uh, and we're doing this in Maya. Um, and then what we do is we'll bring it into ZBrush. And ZBrush is probably the place where we do fabrics and hairs are, are almost the only things we do unless we're just kind of roughing out some complicated shapes. But all our final modeling is usually in Maya except for those fabrics. And so you can see what the fabric looks like here when it's sculpted. Um, and I jotted down some lines over top here so to help kind of break down the understanding because I found it can be a really tricky thing. It seems so simple until you do it and then you put those lines down and you're like, looks great from this angle, it looks terrible from this angle. And you're dropping down the lines a few times. Uh, the images that kind of go along with this, if you look on the far left, there's the image with the red triangles. And this is what we try to avoid, is this saniness where we're, we're dividing lines like dead in the middle, like the spacing between those, those points where the, the fold would end are, are this equidistant. And if you look at the, the next image on the, on, in the middle on the bottom, uh, you know, just offsetting those angles and offsetting where those lines stop and start give you so much more, it just feels so much more dynamic, you know, and if, if you're familiar uh, with the work like J.C. Leindecker, um, always an awesome touchstone to go back to, you know, if you're like, hey, I don't know how this would go. Uh, I always found it super inspiring to kind of look back on. And then the last image here on this slide um, uh, is the image in the middle there. And I, I wish I gave you guys a better image, but this is the, kind of the profile of what folds generally look like in the game. And you know, the, the red one being, sometimes you, somebody will do something and it gets kind of noodly. And he, again, if you find yourself going back on an S-curve, you probably need to change directions again. So we lean heav heavily into these S-curves and C-curves. And uh, you know, I get crap for, for saying, I'll, I'll say say it or don't. You know, it's like the fact is, is that we want you to either, you're gonna do it or you're not, like be big and bold if you're gonna go there. So um, we're trying to capture that, again, across the board, and especially with how we're gonna lay down the fabrics. Um, hair, very similar. Um, and then, um, and then uh, it kind of brings us to that next stage of low poly. And the fact is, is that if we did our jobs right in the blockout, uh, we are good to go. I mean, honestly, most of our heavy lifting has been done already, which is why I'm not going to dig into the low poly stuff. Stay true to the block out and don't screw it up. <laughs> and with Khan, we can talk a little bit about some texture. Right. If you did not screw it up, we get to texture. <laughs> and with texture, basically, we're going to cover stage lighting, uh, the brushes that we use, and, uh, and gradient, sorry, and uh, that weather. Starting with the stage lighting. Stage lighting is something super common amongst pretty much all visual IPs where we bake the downward lighting and we put it in the color. Some of you might be freaking out. Oh no, that you know breaks the deep art. It's all right. We do it because it's cooler. It makes the character pop in the shadow. And it just makes it cooler, I guess. Um, so you can see you know, how much detail they added right there. And uh, next slide. There we go. Gradients. Gradients, uh, it's super important because we can add a lot of details without making it noisy, like without adding too much noise. And here we're gonna explain like three quick examples about how we use them. First one uh, is Jumper Queen's uh, plate on the elbow where you can see it, we added around the edges to make it look like, you know, it's been there for a while, it got some dirt and dust, and it's getting rusty. The middle example uh, on the belts, we added some, some of the dirt because, you know, Junker Queen, Junker Town, a lot of dirt, you know, it probably should be pretty much on a lot of the pieces on, on her. And the last one with Orissa, we added as a style element. And if you look at all the plates on Orissa, there's almost no, you know, a simple flat shaped color because we don't only use gradients in one channel, like not just the hue, we use it also in the value. So you can see it uh, in that last one, right there. That's like pretty much how we focus on these areas and where we have the gradient. It's not random, we have you know, specific places for it. All right, uh, all right, the fancy brushes that we use. We use so many brushes, you guys have no idea, like four of them. <laughs> <laughs> all 
right, so funny thing about this slide is actually we used three, but I just added the last one just to make it fit in the box. I don't want it to look weird. I, I sneak a couple in there every yeah. once in a while, but it's pretty, pretty minimal. But the most important thing to take out of this slide is we don't just randomly place these brushes, is we put them in specific places. So if you look at uh, um, uh, here, you can see that we, we target these areas because we want to like almost make it uh, look like, yeah, dirt uh, collected there because you know that's where it should be, or like to emphasize the form. And on the right side, I oh, there we go. So you can see, you know, where all the dust and dirt collected. So, um, yeah, the fact is we're super deliberate about how we're, the way we place damage, and we try to find that sweet spot between where should it be and kind of what is just cool. You know, we, we lean a little into that cool over correct sometimes where it's just, we, you know, it's just designy-wise, it looks good. Um, so a uh, couple things about how we lay that stuff out. Uh, we have, um, whenever we're doing uh, damage and stuff like this, we try to group things together. Uh, and this is something I didn't really understand early on, like when I was first starting to make models and stuff, like I plop stuff down all over the place. But the same way that you have a gradient that moves from one thing to the next, you can do the same thing with frequency of details, you can do the same thing with size of your shapes. Um, and so when I click here, you can actually kind of see like there's three examples of where dirt and grime and stuff is collected and groups up. And it, it, number one, it gives a sense that Torbjorn's been running around in his workshop and he's getting all oily and dirty and he's kicking stuff around on the, on the floors. But also, design-wise, it gives a sense of movement to the whole character and we get to cherry pick those, those cool spots where we drop the, the design. Um, and then when we're doing things like, um, like chipping for the damage where things have been kind of knocked off, um, the way I like to describe it is, if I took an object and I dropped it on the ground, like what's the first spot that would hit the ground? You know, So those are those spots to choose to kind of pick and drop that stuff. And hopefully this slide kind of makes that pretty clear. Because it's real subtle, and yet you know, like you're getting that sense of realism, but also a designiness uh, around it. And so finally, um, again, we've done our jobs right. Um, we are ready to send this stuff off. Um, unfortunately, we don't have our riggers or animators to, to talk to you guys today, hopefully at a future light box. Uh, but, um, you know, we will send this off to the rigging team. Uh, they will work their magic and they will add physics and all kinds of cool stuff. Uh, the animation team, I mean, those guys are the guys who, you know, got guys and gals, I mean, they, they breathe the life into these characters, like that's where you see these things come to life. The effects will show up and plus it, and I know I don't say it on this, uh, this slide, but our sound guys kill it every time. So, um, so that brings us to the end of our talk. So um, I want to thank you guys all for coming out. Um, uh, if you guys want to find more art that we do, you can find it at these places. Uh, I want to say shout out to Daryl for the obvious reasons. Yeah. Uh, huge, huge thank you uh, to the to the Overwatch team, everybody, uh, and uh, thank you guys for coming out.